All right, super excited today. I've got an amazing guest with us for the next one of these conversations. Uh, Group Diversity Officer of Barclays Bank, one of the world's top 20 banks. I'm really pleased to be joined by Ray Dempsey. How are you doing, Ray? Dean, I'm great. Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really, really delighted to have a chance to have this conversation with you. Brilliant. Well, look, really looking forward to uh, what I think is going to be a wide um, ranging conversation. When we were talking the other day, you shared something with me that I thought was really interesting in the context of where your career is now, that unlike many Americans, we in Europe like to poke fun at our American colleagues for the amount of them that have passports mm. and travel the world. You've never suffered from that, right? You've lived extensively in many countries and many locations around the world from your early life. That was something you you shared, uh, you shared with me the other day. You know, it's true, and I, I poke fun even in my own family sometimes. I, I have one relative in particular who's never even been on an airplane, <laughs> never once in, in his entire life. But I, I had some great fortune, uh, and I've had a, a great adventure of a life and a career in many ways. My father was in the U.S. military, um, in the Army, and so I'm, as we call it, an Army brat. Right. And so in, in my early life, I lived all over the U.S. I lived three years in Germany. Um, which in the end was an extraordinary experience. I, I, I learned so much and got to see a fair bit of Europe even in those years. And I spent 30 years in BP before joining Barclays just in 2021. And in my years in BP, I, I did live and work again all over the U.S. I did assignments all over the world, literally. I, I spent a few years as the, the head of regional function activity in Latin America, in the Caribbean, and strangely, I did that job first from Chicago and then from London. So I tell people I have lifetime status on two airlines <laughs> right. from loads of traveling. But I also lived in London twice, uh, two separate times during my time with BP, and so I had a great opportunity to to live and learn both about life in the UK, and, but this is a great launch pad for much of the rest of the world. Europe, so yeah. some some great adventures. Yeah. I think it's amazing because you spent reasonable blocks of time in so many different places and now being the executive in charge of driving the diversity agenda at such a great bank. How has that diversity of life experience, location, culture and language kind of informed the work that you do today? It must have an impact on the work it, you do It now. absolutely does, Dean. And it's something that I have to admit, I, I didn't see it or understand it along the way, and it's really mostly now in reflection that I can see the difference it's made. I tell people often that as a, as a small child, I, I was often turning up in a new school, right. new friends, new communities. I had to work out who are the mean kids, who's going to beat me up, right. exactly. Right. Who are the smart kids? You know, who are the yeah. athletes? You know, how, how did I want to create my connection in that new place. And it wasn't that I just had to do that once or twice. I had to do that a lot. Right. And what I've discovered is even to this day, those those skills and that sort of way of, of assessing the landscape, yep. the, the sociology and the psychology of the people around me is a big part of the way I operate. Yep. I also developed that deep curiosity about different people, people. different places because of all the adventures, and in a way that I, I couldn't possibly have otherwise matched, that, that absolutely is central to my ability, I believe now, right. to, to operate as the Chief Diversity Officer, to be intentional about being inclusive of people yeah. from, from wherever they are and whatever their background. And, and it's not just my job. In many ways, as I say often now, it's, it's my mission, my right. purpose. It's, it is what I do. Right. Right. I, and I think you make a great point. Something I've made in a similar way, I didn't travel as extensively as, as you described, but growing up in the environment I grew up in, in you know, on our housing estate, our, our housing project, where there were so many different cultures, so many different people from so many different backgrounds, so many different races, languages, which were present on your doorstep, I think it desensitizes you to single tribism, right? There's a yeah. little less of, I belong to this thing and only this thing. Because all around you every day, there's all of these different um, types of people. And I, I often talk about developing that same skill that, that you just referenced, which is an ability to assess the landscape and the hierarchy of a room, both mm. the, the obvious and unobvious hierarchy, uh, yeah. hierarchy of a room, which is something I think has, 
helped me in good uh, in good stead, you know, later later in my career. It, it must be true, Dean. I, I think we probably underestimate that while business often involves certain kinds of technical skills or financial literacy, there's right. there's a list of things that we might associate with business success. But I tell people all the time, it's all fundamentally about sociology and psychology. Of people. <laughs> of people. Of people. That's yeah, right. And that's when you when you time. learn how to navigate across those dimensions, the opportunities available are, are, are endless. Absolutely. And I think, again, something coming back culturally that we underestimate is perhaps a little bit of an innate ability to do that, especially as we travel to new places as you did. We mm-hmm. find ourselves in you know, minority positions, we probably have to lean on that skill uh, a little bit more maybe than, uh, than, than others. It's true. And, you know, I have to reflect on something you, you mentioned, Dean, that you started, or grew up on a council estate. I, I, I wasn't rich. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I won't go so far as to say I was poor. My, my dad is living. He probably wouldn't love to hear me describe <laughs> it that way. But a military life certainly wasn't about extraordinary wealth. I have to admit, I worry sometimes about the the experiences of my own four daughters. They right. they think that life is this way and, and everything <laughs> right. is just sort it's of great. available. Yeah. Um, but it, it there were lots and lots of hard days. And when my father retired from active duty of the military, his transition to civilian life um, was was really difficult. And so there are lots of times that I remember. Uh, even as a teenager, I, I I bought all my own clothes. I had right. jobs. I I had lots of things that I had to cause to happen. And I'm grateful sometimes that my daughters have had a very different experience. Excellent. I also worry sometimes, though, that maybe they don't have the same the same desire, and fire, drive. and yeah. drive as I had to cultivate in order to to find my way through all the things that we face yeah. in life. And I don't mean that I don't think they will, they'll, they'll be successful. They're all off to great starts in their own lives and careers. But, but there is something different about yeah. it, knowing you've got to, you've got to fight. You, you eat yeah. what you kill. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, that's the generational challenge of almost first generation middle class parents, right? Mm-hmm. Now we have to figure out how to parent teach, educate, instill drive and determination in our, in our children using different, you know, d- using different methods. My parents used, uh, in particular my mum, a lot of fear right, to get me to behave a certain way. Yeah. It just doesn't, uh, just doesn't work with, with my kids. So we, you touched a little bit on your, on your career there, 22 years at BP, or was it longer? It was longer. So a, a lot of people have looked at my LinkedIn profile and they, they observe 20 some years. There's a truth. I joined what was Amoco right out of university as an engineer. And Amoco and BP became one through a merger in 1999. So I actually never left a company until I left BP after a full 30 years at the company. Wow. And you had an amazing, uh, amazing rise there. Um, And you touched on some of the different jobs that that you did. What was it like spending so much time in essentially one organization and then coming out and going into a new one after 30 years? What was that, what was that like? Yeah, that's a great question, Dean. I, I'm not sure I, I fully anticipated some of the differences that I would observe, but I, I didn't join what was Amoco and became BP expecting a 30-year career. Um, I was young. I was an engineer. I, I, I was just pursuing opportunity and possibility. I knew I had a curiosity about different kinds of jobs, different ways of managing my career. I could, I could sense that even as a 22-year-old. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason I stayed 30 years is because I had just a, an extraordinary array of different things that I had the chance to try and to do and to learn. I worked as a real engineer. I ran a region of retail sites, four courts in the right. Southeast US. I, I did a lot of jobs called strategy. I worked in multiple functions. I, I worked in oil refineries and I, I was the head of uh, sort of commercial activity for the fuels business in, in the US. I was the head of external affairs in right. Washington DC for BP. Um, and that was the last job I had before I took over there as the chief diversity officer. So I had a, such a great 
array of experiences that I will admit there were many occasions when I contemplated that maybe it was time to, to go. Mm -hmm. It was almost as though someone was monitoring my phone <laughs> and, and could tell when I was feeling that way and this great new adventure would present itself yeah. and, and I was always very, very excited by that. And that, that's the benefit of big corporations, right? And there's mm -hmm. this, I don't know, this dialogue, debate happening around corporate career versus entrepreneurship and the world at the moment is just kind of obsessed with entrepreneurship, working for yourself, being your own boss, starting a business, growing a business. Yeah. There's, the, there's a, a cluster of standout stories built by great entrepreneurs that I think is, you know, over-indexing people towards that. But, but folks are still able to build great careers inside of major corporations. Like, do, do you see that difference? You're pretty close to the HR function at, at, at Barclays. Yeah. Do you see that difference in generational mindset towards corporate career versus entrepreneurship? I do see it, and not just in the context of Barclays or my work. I, I see it in my own family. Right. right. My, I have four daughters, Dean. My wife and I have four daughters, and the way they think about their careers and their work is is dramatically different right. from the way I was minded when I was their age, and and I love it. I, it it excites me. They they see employers as sort of commoditized, okay. and so and it's an interesting yeah. distinction. They yeah. it's not that they don't have a sense of loyalty and commitment to whatever it is they're doing, but they have a deep belief that the employer they have today is. The employer they have today, but they could very well have a different one tomorrow, and and they're more focused on their own sort of career trajectory and the skills and experiences that they're trying to build and accumulate in in service of a longer term career aim. And and I wasn't thinking that way, certainly not at the time. I I saw my opportunity through a particular employer as as being much more sort of long-standing. I, I will say this, I don't think there's a right answer, mm -hmm. whether entrepreneurship or a corporate career. There are real differences. Mm -hmm. um, the rewards in entrepreneurship can be much, much greater. There's right. no question about that. But the slow, steady pace that sometimes is the consequence of a corporate career can also lead to real wealth and, and sort of generational changes for families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people have it just deeply wired into their hearts and into their minds. And I think my second daughter in particular, we, she and I had this discussion just earlier this week. She's, she's a hustler. <laughs> the corporate life is not going to work right. for her. And right. she wants to, to look for and explore those kinds of opportunities that she can go and, and create and cause. And, and that's no bad thing. I, I, I think a person should listen to their own exactly. internal compass. Yeah. They, yeah. they got to follow their instincts, but, but don't be guided by a sort of an external view that one way is better right. or more right than the other. Right. right. I think what you just said is, is the most important element of that thought process, right? Which is, which is self, you know, mm -hmm. which is absolute self without the external um, influence, because I think the world markets entrepreneurship much better than it markets, you know, corporate careers. So if you look externally, you're going to find more positive reference points for entrepreneurship. You're going to find that very thin layer of uber successful, you know, entrepreneurs. Um, you're going to find a, a spread of standout exits that have made people, you know, super wealthy. So it's very easy to follow the marketing towards entrepreneurship and yeah. misunderstand that as the right career path for you. I think you have to look deep internally at the things that drive you, the structures you need to perform and be successful. And what what things yeah what things you find motivating both now and and in the long term something I discovered, and I'm often misreferred to as an entrepreneur because I don't, I don't think that's uh, actually accurate. Something At some I point, you you outgrow that, don't you? <laughs> you well, yeah, you yeah you hope well you hope to or I would hope to, um, but I realised I need the discipline and structure that is more readily available in in the corporate world and in a in a in an enterprise, in a pre-existing enterprise. Mm. In a startup where you have to operate for long periods without that, I would, be, I would be less effective. It was actually the discipline of work starts at nine, so I'm gonna show up at eight, and it finishes at five, so I'm gonna work until six. I actually needed that in my formative years. So pursuing entrepreneurship 
perhaps with the skills and attributes I had earlier in my career, I think would have been a mistake, actually, because it was the, the discipline, the structure, the boss, the mm. hierarchy, the objectives, the demands. Those were the things I performed against, which you know, built, I built my career uh, in that framework. I wouldn't have been able to do that uh, in entrepreneurship, which is why I always say to people, like, look at those things, consider those things before making that, um, making that kind of career yeah. choice. It's a powerful reflection, Dean. I, I often offer the same kind of advice. It's, it's great to have a dream. It's necessary, I'd argue, to, to have a, a sense of where you're trying to get to. But then you've got to be really thoughtful about, so what, what do I need to get there? What skills, what experiences, what things do I need in my, in my bag in order to get me to where I want to go? And sometimes the choices you have to make in service of getting there will not look exactly like the, the dream yeah. that you have in mind. Yeah. I, I said that I, I had the opportunity to, to run a, a, a region of retail sites, four courts in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And I tell this story often, Dean. I, it, for me, it's a really important reflection. I was in investor relations for Amico at the time of the BP Amico merger. And my client group was that retail fuels business. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of my time in investor relations, just immediately after the merger, I said, I'd like to go work in retail. That's, I, I want to be the CEO of my own piece of business. And mm -hmm. I, I'm really excited about the opportunity. And I said to the head of that part of the business at the time, I, but I'd sure like to have the chance to really get to learn and understand the business before I'm in charge of something I don't really know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize what I just said is, please, can I go work at a gas station? <laughs> and I did for months, five or six months I spent at a, at a handful of sites around that like region. Actual full court type. Actual, in the, in the, in the full court. So wow. I worked all three shifts. I, I can't even begin to describe the kinds of things that happen at 3 a.m. <laughs> on a full Could court in Atlanta, much. Georgia. But uh, at another much. time, uh, I'll tell you those stories. But I, I mean, I was mopping floors, cleaning bathrooms, making coffee, right. stocking the cooler, counting cigarettes, all the things right. that a, a retail site employee would do. I, I did all those did. things for months. And there were moments during that time that I thought, what in the world have I done? <laughs> right. I'm an engineer, I've got an MBA, and, right. and I work I at a gas station. Yeah. But easily on reflection, it was the greatest luxury in my corporate Why? career. Why did you describe that? I was getting paid loads of money uh -huh. to, to learn this business in a, in a real and a granular way. Uh -huh. And I also was building relationships with the site managers. Each of those stores, those managers eventually, they reported to me. Right. And they didn't know that I was going to be their boss. Oh, but the, okay. the way that I worked and the discipline I demonstrated earned me their okay. confidence, their trust, their respect in yeah. a way that I probably couldn't have achieved right. any other way. Something else we, we, took, we touched on the other day is, you know, as leaders now coming back to this corporate blessed entrepreneurship and the the point you made that a lot of the generations behind now are looking at their employer as somebody who's going to serve them as much as they're going to serve the employer and often for shorter uh, moments in time than you know maybe you and i experienced um, growing up you hit that point as a leader where you've got somebody in your team they're doing great work for you you're investing in developing them and then they knock on the door and say hey you know i'm I'm out of here, which is something that I've had to come to terms with, you know, over time, and I have a, I have a more refined way of viewing that today than I did seven or eight years ago. But we were talking about this the other day, and you had a really interesting reflection on that, which would be yeah. great for you to share. Yeah, it, it is. It's a really important space, Dean. In lots of ways, we talk about retention often in Barclays, and frankly, in the broader corporate world, Terra, it's, 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 a it's, super it's a big key priority. Metric, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the cost of acquiring new talent and training and developing is right. substantial. So if you've got good people, you want to it's important them. to keep them. But, but there's the truth. I've had four women from my team in Barclays leave Barclays in the time that I've been here. And, and that's, in some ways, it's been hard. Yeah. Um, and, and it creates for me a challenge of identifying and cultivating and building new talent. And so that's, that is a real thing. But, but there's another side to this that I, I tell people we, we should celebrate. Mm -hmm. Because these four women left my team 
to go on to be chief diversity officers at other enterprises. Right. They, they got an opportunity to accelerate in their careers in ways they couldn't have done had they remained in Barclays, not on the same time scale. Right. They needed you to move on, right, to they, take that spot. Exactly. And it's a great sign that the outside world sees Barclays as a great source right. of talent in, in DEI and more broadly. And that's something we should be proud of. Yeah. For sure. So it does mean that the, the persistent challenge is to be on the lookout for great talent. It, it means we have to be committed to the way we invest in and support and develop our talent and, and to appreciate that it might be that some of that investment ultimately will go to the benefit of <laughs> the next employer. But, but it means we also have the sort of the, the identity of being a great place yeah. to learn and grow. Exactly. And that means our ability to attract great new talent in is, is greater and greater. Yeah. So it, it is gonna be different. We probably shouldn't count on people coming and spending 20 and 30 year careers like I did, but we can still create a lot of value through our investment in people for the time that they'll, yeah, they'll be, be with there. us. Yeah, it's almost, for me, it, and it's such a dichotomy, right? I, I'm, totally schizophrenic on this topic, you know, and I, I tell my leadership team all the time, every time somebody walks out of this organization, we take it personally, and I take it personally. It may be an employee I never met, it may even be an employee I never knew was part of the company, but any time I hear that somebody leaves, I consider it a failure of the organization. It means that they didn't love it, they didn't enjoy it, they see some other place as being more enjoyable or, or more enriching for them, um, we didn't create enough new opportunities that could satisfy their career demands within our organization. And I think all of those things are our challenges as a leadership team to create that constantly evolving uh, positive environment. So I have that side of my brain. Then I have the other side of my brain which says, hey, if somebody comes here and works for a good period of time, does great work for the organization, and develops to the point that their next step is such an advancement that it can't be satisfied here, then maybe that is success. Maybe yeah. that makes us a good company. Make, maybe that makes us uh, good leaders. But depending on which day you catch me, right, and which, how good my sleep was the night before, I can be between one of those two uh, frames of mind. It's such a difficult thing I've found to, to reconcile. Yeah, I think that's spot on, and it's, probably gonna always be that way right. as you invest yourself in people. When they go, it's disappointing. But but great leaders grow great leaders, yeah. Dean. So uh, reflect on what it says about the your own leadership and yeah. your own commitment to those people. And the truth is you, you're now planting ambassadors in for your enterprise in other places. And, yeah. and that over time pays dividends. Yeah. I, I've. With my heart, I think you're right. I don't know that we'll cure my immediate disappointment for every resignation letter just uh, yeah. just yet. Now, it was an interesting way that you you came to be a chief diversity officer, uh, working for the president and chairman of, of BP in North America. But it might be a good idea just to frame for people watching what a chief diversity officer is, because it's a, I guess, a fairly new executive um, position. So let's just frame that because I want to talk to you about the mandate that you had before and, and now. So what is a chief diversity officer? There's probably a few things that I would illustrate. I, I think one of the first and most important elements is to build a sense of transparency about where you are. Mm -hmm. You got to lean on the data. Uh, social justice is a really, really important thing. Mm -hmm. And there's no question, Dean, in my life, um, in, in my community, engagements, the things I do, I, I certainly work for and fight for and advocate for social justice. It's, it is a good thing. It's the right thing. Mm -hmm. But in a way that sometimes startles people, maybe even aggravates people, what I say is when I go to work, social justice, that's not what I do. Right. And, and I know there's loads of opinions on this. My belief is that the language of business is rooted in the data. So what I've tried to bring to Barclays is a real discipline about examining and understanding what the data tells us. Where are we today? Mm -hmm. 
where are there gaps against the talent available in the world around us mm -hmm. in the processes that we're applying to ensure that every time we fill a job we're drawing from the entirety mm -hmm. of the available talent pool and that we're seeing equitable processes in the way that we support people in their training their development their promotions their mm -hmm. progress their compensation and so in Barclays, I, I aim first to bring that sense of real understanding and transparency in the way we examine the data. Okay. I seek to create broad engagement. Sometimes conversations about diversity, they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They're often about topics that we, we feel uncomfortable right. about. We're worried about saying the wrong things, especially in today's world, there's this, this fear of political correctness and the, the political divide is great and so sometimes we just don't want to talk about it mm. and yet we must yeah. the only way to make progress to to learn and to build empathy and ultimately to be committed to the necessary change is is by actually hearing and understanding lived experiences mm -hmm. and so my team and i we we work to create conversations as much as we possibly can. We ignore the notion of diversity fatigue, uh, which I know is a real thing, <laughs> right. but every chance we have to create interactions and engagement and conversation, mm -hmm. we do it. And, and then the third element I, I think is probably the most important is as much as I care and, and see the essential requirement of transparency and the need to create engagement and conversation, it's gotta be accompanied by accountability. Mm -hmm. For, 30 years in my corporate life, I watched diversity efforts. So diversity efforts in corporations are not a, a, a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for a very long time. And I believe for much of the three decades that I observed it, we relied mostly on good intentions. Mm -hmm. Go to any company's website. I bet I could find it on yours. And it'll say, we want to be the company that, that allows everyone to bring their whole selves to work. Or we want to take advantage of all talent, no matter where it comes from, mm -hmm. what it looks like, who they love, what, all, the, all the language that, that often you'll see. And usually at this point, I say, blah, blah, blah. And it's not because I don't think those words are important. They are. Um, and we have the same words. But we can't just hope that we create that kind of company. We've got to create an accountability and a set of metrics mm -hmm. that allow us to see that we're making real progress mm -hmm. along the way. And without that accountability, without treating diversity, equity, and inclusion, just like you do any other imperative in your business, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're just hoping for a better future. And, and, and often that just doesn't work. Doesn't show up, right. So what we're building in Barclays is, is this deeper sense of real ownership and accountability all the way through from the most senior executives at, at group executive committee all the way to the front line. Mm -hmm. so, so what are the outcomes we want to drive at Barclays from those, those three kind of pillars of, of action? What, what, what's the outcome? A more diverse workforce measured or, or kind of quantifiable in what, in what sense? Yeah, so I think there's a few themes here that, again, sometimes people think about differently. There's been a, a big shift sometimes, even in the descriptions of, of teams like the one that I lead. Some people have dropped the diversity and they focus just on inclusion. Some people have put the inclusion first and some people have added belonging. There's, there's a lot of ways now that you'll see the work described. I have a, I have a view that inclusion, full inclusion can't really be achieved without diversity, mm -hmm. and diversity cannot be sustained without inclusion. Mm -hmm. And the access to both is through a deep determination around equity mm -hmm. and equitable processes. So get a group of people around a table that are roughly of the same background. And, and it's fair to say that even people who might look the same, they don't all think the same. Mm -hmm. There's diversity of thought, that's true. But get a group of people that are largely of the same background and get them all to swear to be 100% inclusive all the time, mm -hmm. they will fail. Mm -hmm. They'll fail because they have blind spots. They don't have the same lived experiences of people of, of different ethnicities, of different backgrounds, of different sexual orientations. All kinds of dimensions of difference bring in a different experience of life 
that then shape the way you contribute into a conversation and into an enterprise. Mm -hmm. So to say that we're just going to work on being really, really inclusive and the diversity will come mm. is, is a delusion. I don't believe that works. You've got to be determined to drive diversity to accompany the, the growth and the improvement in creating an inclusive environment. So your question, Dean, what are the metrics? We have in Barclays two ambitions, a global gender ambition that helps us to measure the progress of women at the most senior levels in the bank. We're aiming to get to 33% women at managing director and director. And we call it an ambition because it's not a destination. Mm -hmm. When we get to 33%, we won't be done. We'll continue to drive for further progress. We have some ambitions we call race at work ambitions around race and ethnicity. They're in the UK and in the US. And we're, we've just reset those ambitions to grow to even greater proportions, those underrepresented colleagues that are part of our workforce. Mm -hmm. We've made remarkable progress in, in actually a relatively short amount of time. Right. No magic, no preferences. We aren't just going out and hiring people because they are different. Mm -hmm. What we're being intentional about is going to look in all the places we can for the available talent. And when we fill jobs, we, we want to have a confidence that we are drawing actually from the entirety yes. of the available talent. When we do that, we always pick the very best person for the job. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's something I've been um, very intentional about, that in this pursuit of a, you know, more diverse workforce and more inclusive workforce, we have to be very careful with positive discrimination because that can place an unfair burden on the successful candidate, but also the team around that person, right? If, if this individual is not the best candidate or the best talent for the position, you can actually do you know, a, a, you know, a, lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of harm. Yeah. You mentioned something a moment ago, which again is something you and I talked about um, when we met at, at Barclays a, a while ago, that there is a difference in my mind, and, and you said it beautifully as well, between societal um, diversity and inclusion and equity and corporate diversity uh, and inclusion. Because like you, I believe we need to approach the two differently. Like in society, we need people to be treated fairly. We need people to be treated equally. We need people to have uh, equal opportunities at, at every tier of, of society, irrespective of background, race, creed. We're just looking for fairness. We're looking for blanket fairness for human beings, which doesn't sound like too much to ask in society, but the world, the world is full of evidence that we've got a long way to go there. But that's what we're looking for in society. In corporations, especially as a leader, diversity is a competitive advantage. And we pursue it, and I pursue it, because it will make my company better, stronger, more competitive, grow faster, beat the competition. That's why diversity um, is important to me. And I, would want, I wonder what your experience is, because sometimes in the workplace, people confuse those two things, yeah. right? And it, it makes it hard. I think it makes it hard for leaders to manage. I think it makes it very hard for leaders like us um, to manage. But have you observed that same thing where people collide the societal with the corporate? All the time, Dean. And, and it may be that this will be a persistent challenge, and, and I'm up for it. Uh, I'll, <laughs> right. I'll keep talking about it. I hear still too often from really, really well-meaning and deeply committed people that we have to do this because it's the right thing right. to do. Right. And so I'll be clear, is it the right thing to do? Of course it is, I, I believe that. Is that the, the reason that it'll be sustained in a corporate context? I, I don't no. believe that. Right. We talk about why we do this work in Berkeley's around three particular themes. And the first one is the one that you've hit on, performance. Mm -hmm. There's now loads of research and data. I, I think we can now describe it as empirical data that say more diverse and more inclusive firms literally That's perform cool. better. Yeah. Um, whether it's the McKinsey study from 2015, they updated it in 2020 or 2021, but they aren't the only ones. There are, there are multiple sources now, and, and they're, they're all clear. The, the conclusion is very clear. And what I often say in the bank is, to paraphrase it, more diverse and inclusive firms make more money. Yep. <laughs> right. and, and that maybe, perhaps, is, is motivation enough, but there's two more. Uh -huh. there's, there's one that I call license to operate. And, and I mean this actually in multiple dimensions. In the UK, our regulator, 
uh, the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulatory Authority. They, they have just launched consultation around uh, regulatory requirements for financial services firms on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Our regulator is requiring us to treat this as a non-financial risk that actually underpins our yeah. ability to operate as an enterprise. I didn't know that. That's good to hear. Actually. It is. And it's not just the regulator. Um, the truth is, I spend a lot of time with Barclays' investor relations team talking to investors and shareholders mm -hmm. who want to know what are we doing right. about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're not just curious. Right. This is forming the basis of decisions they make about where they're going to put their money. Capital. Right. It matters to customers and consumers more than ever before. It matters to prospective employees. We've seen data that tell us that prospective candidates for roles at Barclays, when they go to our website mm -hmm. to explore and learn about Barclays, they spend more time on the diversity, equity, inclusion part of our website than any other part yeah. of, our, of our web presence. And so we know those things all matter. And, and can, increasingly, it's the basis on which people make decisions yeah. about with whom they'll do business, yeah. where they want to work, and where they'll invest. Yeah. It, it is absolutely our license to operate and, and, and people's requirements and expectations that we must fulfill. Yeah. But there's a third piece that matters a lot, and it's our access to talent. It's, it's partly that point I've made already about prospective candidates, but but it's important to put it into numerical context, Dean. The most recent census in the UK showed that of all the people in London, 47.2% mm -hmm. of them identify as being an ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. And then there's an other category. Um, and so if you add the ethnic minority and the other category, it's a it's majority, majority. Mm -hmm. of every person in London mm -hmm. in the most recent census. In the United States, there's data that talks about the rapid change of demographic uh, evolution, and, and the pace of change is even greater in the U.S. In the most largest cities, uh, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston, more than 80% of every young person under age 20 now is someone that in the U.S. we've always described as an ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, every company has to either get good now at attracting, retaining, and developing diverse talent, mm -hmm. or it won't be very long, <laughs> right. literally, yeah. before they're not just competitively disadvantaged. They might be out of business. Yeah. They probably won't have enough people mm -hmm. to get work done. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the right thing to do. It's a business imperative. It, it, it creates competitive advantage, and over time, it actually is an essential requirement just to stay in right. business to with the changing workforce. Yeah. So th that's great. I, I hadn't understood the, um, you know, the statistics around the way the ethnic makeup of the talent pool is changing in the way that you mm -hmm. just described. That's pretty remarkable. That, you know, that in itself will change the the um, the aesthetic of the workplace, right? The the demographic uh, of the workplace. I often describe it to my team as, you know, the diversity of thought and mm -hmm. diversity of thought being the bedrock of innovation, right? Yeah. It, innovation happens because somebody dared to challenge the way something was was being done or the, the way that we've always um, done something. And I always say, if I have a team of, of 10 people, a team of 10 people who grew up in the same place as me, have the same cultural affiliation as me, have the same education as me, um, just think similarly to me, that in some respects can be an attractive team to work in and, and operate, right? We're gonna get each other's language, we're gonna read the nuances better, yeah. we're gonna reach agreement on things probably faster because we're gonna just see things through the through the same lens. And you can be drawn into that, that comfort of uh, familiarity and velocity because everything is similar um, to you. And I think there's definitely an advantage of speed in yeah. that type of environment. However, any idea that originates among that team will be challenged through one lens because we all think and view that thing the same or very similar, right? So we've, we've gonna view this through one lens, it's gonna make its way through a, a review period extremely quickly, and we're all gonna agree. If we put that same idea through 10 different thought processes, people who have come from a different experience, people who have seen that problem before, people who have never seen that problem before, 
people who have been educated differently, people who are motivated by you know, capitalists versus socialists, yeah. all of these different just human lenses through which we view things and we view the world. If this idea can make it through those 10 different lenses, it's a much stronger outcome at the end. It's been challenged more as it's gone through that review cycle. So it's a much stronger outcome. So people are drawn to you know, the, the familiarity of similarness and, and the sameness because things happen quickly, they're more comfortable. Yeah. But the advantage is in the challenge <clears throat> of thought and the diversity of thought. And yes, it might take a little bit longer to, to move things through, but you just get richer outcomes at the end, right? The thing that comes out the other end is, is richer. And that's been the most effective way I've been able to get corporations, boards and investors to, to hit the gap, like accelerate on the, you know, on the pursuit of, of diversity, which I think is kind of similar to the way you, uh, you framed it. It is. You know, our CEO at, at Berkeley's, Venkat, as we affectionately call him, he, he and I had a conversation to open our inclusion summit this past summer. And, and in our conversation, he challenged leaders in Berkeley's to intentionally and proactively every conversation, every meeting to seek a dissenting view. Right. So after you've gone around the table and you think you've got the decision, he's, he's now committed that he's going to pause and he's going to say, okay, now I need, I need to hear from someone who disagrees, right. or sees it differently. Right. And, and that challenge inevitably will lead to a better, better outcome. result. Yeah. It, it yeah. I think you and I were chatting about one of the classic case studies of what we didn't used to describe as, as a diversity um, issue, but it's from the 1970s when General Motors or Chevrolet um, had introduced the Chevy Nova in the U.S. market and decided they were going to launch that in Mexico, and and they did, and no one was around the table to say that Nova in Spanish means doesn't go. <laughs> so they launched the Chevy Nova in Mexico and they didn't sell so any cars because the name of that car is doesn't go. And, and so even though it's, it's ages old and it was before we even used this language, I think it's a classic example of how absent that diversity of thought, absent real difference around the table, you can, you can do things that seem like they're the best reasonable decision but they're missing lived experience that right. can, in the end, help to create a better outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something uh, you know, I really try to pursue. And, and I'm very proud when we look around our exec table at, at Fortero. It's diverse in many a aspects. There's more work to do to introduce more diversity. But I think we're doing our best work when we're heavy in debate about the best way to do something. That is actually a, a measure of us earning our money and, and doing our job. When we're all checkboxing stuff and letting it fly through the process just, you know, quickly, it, it feels like we're not, you know, we're not doing our work. And I really welcome that challenge. And I was on the road recently visiting Fortero and our offices. And one of the most pleasing things was to hear people challenging what we're doing and challenging the way we do things and asking mm -hmm. searching questions because now we can put these things through. Yeah. Uh, through good filters. Something else we, we talked about the other day is the expectation that sometimes comes from within our culture and our community that when guys like you and I uh, find ourselves in, in leadership positions that suddenly now you know, we're going to um, create disproportionately favorable outcomes for people who look like us. And I, I get that to a degree, but I can't imagine what the chief diversity officer of one of the world's largest banks um, gets in that, in that sense. And you mentioned that that is an expectation that you've carried a little bit through your, through your career. It's true, Dean. I have to admit, I maybe should have anticipated this or, or thought more about how it might play. But when I first took on the role of chief diversity officer in BP, in the Americas, I, I, I think many black colleagues believed that everything was going to be better, that, that they'd all get a promotion, they'd all get a pay rise, that right. they'd, they'd find a completely different career trajectory. Our guy's in. Our, our guy's <laughs> in. The, he's in the spot. Our exactly. <laughs> and of course, that didn't happen. And so there were 
there were some people disappointed and I did have some some tough conversations. There's there's a couple of things that I've tried to remind them about though along the way and 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 it's it has remained sort of central to my approach. I I make no apologies about being black. I am very proud of who I am and in my heritage and my history and the things I've learned and and the approach that I bring to the work. So I don't set aside mm-hmm. who I am. So I've, in fact, I've, I've in, in many conversations or panels or or um, sort of. Um, big town hall meetings, I've sometimes said, there's something about me. I don't say it often, it's not in my bio, but I'm black <laughs> and everyone will laugh and because it's dead obvious. And I, I say it really to sort of diffuse the reality that I, I am not setting aside right. my background, my lived experience. But my job is not to be chief diversity officer for black people. Right. My job is to ensure that we actually include and create equitable opportunities and and ultimately representation for people of all dimensions of difference. Right. There is something that people often understand or misunderstand, Dean, that I, I worry about, and it's for, for white men in our workforce. And oftentimes they believe that diversity, equity, inclusion, it's not for them and mm-hmm. that they aren't beneficiaries of it and that in many ways they might even believe it works against, against them. them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just not true. Um, what we mean by diversity is not everyone but white men. Right. What we mean by it is not just right. white men. Right. And that's a really important right. difference. And there's often a worry that it means that white men have to give up something, that they, they get a smaller slice mm-hmm. of the pie. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that either. There are realities that white men have been overrepresented in, in leadership, in mm-hmm. companies, in lots of industries, and so that is a real dynamic. But even as we ask them to expect to be less overrepresented, there's another truth. If we really believe in the idea that more diverse and inclusive firms perform better, mm-hmm. that performance then underpins growth. Mm-hmm. So the truth is, we're going to have a bigger more, pie. More opportunities. There's plenty for of pie. Yeah. And there's, there's plenty of pie for everybody. Right. And, and right. that's the mindset that I think we have to take in mm-hmm. our approach to this. Mm-hmm. So Barclays, heavy, uh, heavy global presence, a few dominant um, global footprints. And I know you're, you're traveling quite a lot, having traveled a lot for, for most of your career. Like, how do you... How do you manage that? How do you manage the demands of the role and the demands of travel plus family? You, mem- you mentioned your, your four daughters earlier. Yeah. So I have to admit, balance is probably not the right word. Yeah. And, and I, I'm all in favor of people striking the right balance for them, whatever that looks like. But, but 50-50 is a, is a tough aim. I, I have traveled quite a lot actually for much of my career and, and Barclays indeed is a global enterprise. Our, our single biggest colleague base of course is here in mm-hmm. the UK but but a full third of our company is in Asia Pacific, substantial presence in India. Um, a big part of the revenue production for the bank sits in the US, um, in New York and in Wilmington, Delaware. So there are, there are lots of places that for me are important places to get to. Um, the mistake some people make is presuming that corporate and business travel is, is all glamorous. <laughs> right, that's right. not true. Uh, right. It's usually fine, but the truth is there are many occasions when things don't work right. right. The plane right. is canceled or the train doesn't go, and, right. and then that disruption actually also really disrupts life. And so, and th- there's nowhere more comfortable than your own home. Either. That's right. Like people often, like there's this romance around business travel, and I think for the first year or two years, it was very romantic, and by year three, I was kind of, you know, d- done with it, and that was 20 years ago now. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's true. I, I, when I'm at home, I love to just be at home, and sometimes it aggravates my wife if I don't want to go to an event or exactly. go out to dinner. Actually, I just, I just want to sleep in my bed. <laughs> but uh, I think the way that I've chosen to manage it kind of falls into two different dimensions. I, I am not a I call it a corporate tourist. I don't go places just because I want to see them. I am intentional about going to Barclays sites everywhere that that we are. And even across the UK, I've I've been to to multiple sites, Radbrook and Northampton, and of course our our main offices uh, in Canary Canary Wharf. Wharf. 
um, multiple sites across the U.S. I'll spend time in Asia Pacific. I have some of my own team, both in India and in Singapore. So there is a there is a need to get to those places, and so I, I, I I'm okay with that. In fact, I try to build that into my schedule. My wife and I now are empty nesters. We, my wife and I have four daughters, and so the youngest of them is is a university student. Um, she's actually studying abroad right now, so she's in Strasbourg, France, and, and I'll see her this weekend, Dean. So I, I take advantage of opportunities, even when I'm out and about, to, to kind of maintain and build and strengthen those family connections. When I'm at home, what I say is I, I aim to be ferociously present, present. Yep. and I don't always achieve it, but it's, it's always my aim. Yep. And so when my daughter was at home and I was at home, she wouldn't have to fight for my attention with my mobile or my, my PC. When I get home, I'm pretty good at shutting down my yeah. device and, yeah. and ignoring it. And there's always loads of email waiting for me when I turn it back on. But I, I had to be intentional yeah. about preserving and, and prioritizing my opportunities to, to be present with my yeah. family. And even though things have changed with everyone either off on their own or at university, I, I still try to apply that same yeah. kind of discipline. Yeah, it's the, same, it's the same lesson I learned over time. Earlier in my career, I took pride in being ever available for work. I was the person doing email at 1 and 2 a.m. I was the person who, I remember being at Oracle, you know, I would take... I would deliberately take red-eye flights to new locations because a red-eye meant I wasn't missing anybody's or, yeah. or anybody's significant part of the day. And I would land, shower, and go straight into the office. And I really reveled in the reputation I was building for myself as a person who seemed to be able to work 24 hours of the mm. day and never sleep and you know, was putting at risk his, his kind of family life. Later in my career, I've learned the lesson I think you just described, which is when you're in it, you know, you're super in it, you're working and you're committed and you're hopefully making good decisions and getting good work done. And then when you're not in it, don't be in it. Right? Try to yeah. step away from it. I'm still wrestling I, with the midnight emails a little bit. Uh, I still need to kill myself for that addiction, but I've, I think I've learned a little bit of what you just described. It, and it's a journey. It, there's probably no end point. You'll get to a place that'll feel different from where you have been. Then you'll decide you, you want to even further change sort of cultivate more. the way you work. But I, it's both a strength and a weakness for me. Um, I try to be intensely present, wh whatever it is that I'm doing. So for the time you and I have been talking, I am just talking to you. Yeah. And my phone may have rang 17 times. <laughs> I'll have 30 emails. And right. I have a lot of colleagues who, you know, they, they are great multitaskers. And they can be in a meeting and do email and right. do IM. I, my brain doesn't work <laughs> that way. I, when I'm talking to you, I'm just talking to you. And I think people appreciate that. It just means that when I get through the day of talking to people all day, I'll open my computer and there's loads there waiting for me, Absolutely. and so I, I've just come to live with that. Yeah. So, so we met, um, and it was such a, a, a brilliant uh, experience and engagement because Barclays were you know, gracious enough to invite me to, to do a, a talk to the BPRG uh, group, which you know, we should talk about for a moment. And one of the things that's important to me and, and Full Family Group is we try not to do things which are just isolated to, to Black History Month, right? Any, in any way that we can support corporations um, in their kind of celebration of Black History Month, we're, we're open to it. But we like it to be something that reaches beyond just um, that month. And that was a, a conversation we had with Barclays and they were kind of super open to that. And together we've managed to define a number of things and initiatives that we'll, we'll do together for all young professionals, including uh, and maybe a little bit more focused on those from, from BPRG, which, which was great to do the first thing, um, great to have that conversation, but maybe talk a little bit about the BPRG uh, group and, and why it exists. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I first want to make sure that everyone watching this knows just how fantastic you were in the time you spent with us at Berkeley's. I, I loved having a chance to chat with you and then in the course of the conversation that you had, the the insights and the experiences that you shared were, were just oh, hugely you. powerful. I, I really admire, Dean, what you've done, what you've built, 
both in your business and in the other enterprises around which you and your family are are so committed it, it makes such a such an important difference and so thank you, thank you for, for that uh, so bprg i should first say is at barclays it's the black professionals resource group we actually have 12 ergs that we operate across the bank um, and all of them represented in in our our UK business, and so it's it's great fun. The BPRG has really matured, even in the time that I've been in the bank. It's the structure, the processes, the events that they execute, the way they support each other. They've even launched a development program by by the ERG aimed at more junior colleagues, which is is off to such a great start and really impacting and, and supporting the career progress of, of junior colleagues in Barclays. I have a, a huge affection for BPRG and I, I've said it a few times and since it's just you and I and just between <laughs> us, I'll, I'll, I'll say it here. I, I, I don't have a favorite resource group. I, I'm the steward of all Ooh. of them. But if I did, <laughs> BPRG would certainly be, be high on the list. Um, it's, the, the Black History Month activities that we do in, in the bank, they actually are entirely hosted by the resource group. And right. my team and I, we, we tell them we are at your service, we'll provide resource, we'll provide money, we'll, we'll participate and contribute, uh, but it's, it's for you. It's you. And, yeah. and so the, the cultivation even of your presence as a guest, Dean, was not by me or my team. I was, right. I was delighted that it happened and that I had the chance to participate, but that was the effort and the thinking and the strategy and the relationships cultivated through our Black Professionals mm -hmm. Resource Group. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. I, I think our, our viewers will really take a lot from hearing directly from one of the execs at such a great uh, corporation. Thank you for spending the time and traveling all the way uh, over here, and I'm sure we'll get time to spend uh, more time together in the in the future so thank you dean thanks so much for having me and for for doing this work it is meaningful and, and if it if it inspires or aggravates or otherwise provokes anyone i, I think then it's served its its purpose okay. i i've loved spending time with you and i look forward to our next conversation